I'm currently doing my PhD at the Technical University of Denmark. Uh, you might think Denmark nuclear, that's uh, something, that's a weird combination. Well, we actually do have some interest uh, and it's rekindling and that's very great news. Um, well, at the university where I'm doing my PhD, we have a small group in Natronics and uh, there is this uh, PhD project that I'm working on, which is about the multi-physics modeling of molten salt reactors. A couple of months ago, the BP annual report on 2019 energy outlook was out. There were some key trends that are actually very interesting. Uh, first of all, the global energy demand was up by 2.9%. And uh, the sources that provided this uh, increased demand for energy was, uh, were mainly natural gas and renewables. But what is interesting is that coal consumption was up by 1.4%, which is its highest for the last seven years. And that also means that the carbon emission was up. And that was up by a whole 2%, which is again uh, the highest uh, for the past 10 years. So all of this indicates that despite all these talks that we have, that we need to do something about carbon emission, we need to do something about clean energy production, the numbers are stubbornly going in wrong direction. And if we want to solve this problem, if we want to uh, have this sustainable path in energy sector, then we need to bring in all clean energy players. And as we already discussed today, nuclear is one of those. But the conventional nuclear, unfortunately, is not popular anymore, at least in many, many countries, like in Europe, many countries are planning to phase it out. Well, um, partly this is because conventional nuclear is becoming gradually more and more expensive because it's safe by engineering, which means that to make a conventional nuclear power plant safe, we need to add more systems. That means that we need more cost to build it, we need more cost to maintain it, and at the end, the energy that a conventional reactor is going to produce is economically not viable. It's not interesting for developing countries that need a lot of energy by not paying so much. To solve that problem, again, we talked a lot about it today, so I'm not going to go into many details. Thorium is a way, because it has many, many advantages Based on thorium, we can implement closed fuel cycle, which means we are going to have less uh, high-level nuclear waste. We are going to utilize our fuel better. Then, of course, thorium is much more abundant than uh, uranium, so we don't have to worry about running out of it. And it has a lot of um, good chemical and physical properties. For example, the thorium oxide um, is stable compared to uranium oxide, and it doesn't oxidize further. Uh, from the thorium O2. Well, uh, thorium combined with molten salt is yet another privilege because molten salt itself, liquid fuel, um, provides us with several very interesting features. I mentioned before safety by engineering, which is for, uh, true for conventional reactors. Well, molten salt reactors are safe by physics. Uh, we already saw some speakers showing the fuel drainage system and that makes it inherently safe by physics because there is nothing we can do to stop the fuel from, uh, well, of course, if the freeze plug is designed correctly, we can do nothing to stop this physical process from happening and then this fuel is just going to cool down by natural convection. So uh, one of the worst nightmares of a nuclear engineer, which is the increasing of fuel temperature, core meltdown, etc., it's just not viable for liquid fuel systems. We have an example that such a reactor can work. That's the molten salt reactor experiment, which has been conducted at Oak Ridge National Lab. That was a graphite moderated uh, molten salt reactor. Fuel flew in these graphite channels. So we want to do this, but there is a slight complication if we want to be able to license these type of reactors and to build them. And this complication is that, as of nowadays, we don't have regulatory compliance software to license them. Because uh, the software that works for conventional solid field reactors, such as uh, MCMP or ANSYS, it will not work for liquid fuel systems. 
Why is that the case? Basically, that's because a strong feedback between thermal hydraulics and natronics, which is at a completely different level than when we are talking about solid fuel drift of delayed neutron precursors. So as you know, we cannot have a reactor that is operating on prompt neutrons. We need to have the delayed neutrons to be able to control the reactor. Well, for solid fuel, delayed neutron precursors decay in almost at the same point where they are born, so they are static in the fuel. But when we are dealing with liquid fuel, the delayed neutron precursors are transported with the flow which means that we can have them decaying in the parts of the core that have less importance. We can have delayed neutron precursors that will drift completely out of the primary system before they will decay. And that means that the delayed neutrons that will burn from these precursors are not going to help us to control the reactor. So we need to be able to capture this um, feedback mechanism correctly if we want to be able to uh, model uh, liquid fuel reactors. And we need to develop new approaches. We need to develop new software for doing this. Because as I mentioned, uh, the ones that are meant for solid fuel, they just cannot take care of this phenomena. So what I will do today, I will sh uh, talk about um, such an attempt of uh, modeling molten salt reactor that we did in our group. And we used two software for that. Uh, for the natronics part, we used Serpent, which is a Monte Carlo-based uh, natron transport co code. And for the thermal hydraulics part, we used OpenFOAM, which is a C++-based library which can take care for uh, describing the flow. So you can see uh, uh, there on the left the core model of the molten salt reactor experiment. We have simplified it, of course, a lot. Uh, for example, the control roads and the experimental road are just represented as four cylinders, uh, as you can see in the very center of the core. The entire core model, we made it just to get an initial idea of what is the fuel vector composition to have a critical state and what's the power distribution within the core. But actually, the simulations, the coupled simulations, we run on a single channel. A single channel of a molten salt reactor uh, experiment design uh, looks like that, as you can see on the top. And the channel uh, was uh, stadium shaped. But actually, since we had a goal of comparing to uh, ORNL calculations, they did, back in the day, they assumed a cylindrical channel for their calculations. So we did two models. The cylindrical one to be able to compare to ORNL calculations and then to investigate the impact of having the actual uh, stadium shaped fuel channel. We also did that one here. So at the end, the simplified computational um, model looks like uh, what, you, what you can see here below. This is the scheme implemented between the two software for coupling them. So as I said, we have Serpent for Natronics part, OpenFOAM for Thermal Hydraulics part. And we start with a Serpent uh, steady state uh, neutron distribution calculation. And after that, we are getting, uh, as an output from that, the distribution of the delayed neutron uh, field, which we feed then into the transient mode calculation. I don't want to go too much into technical details here, but what is important is that ultimately our goal here is to be able to um, simulate this drift of delayed neutron precursors. And to do that, we need a uh, position. So we need to know where in our core these delayed neutron precursors were born. And then depending on our uh, fuel flow velocity, we have to shift this position of the birth of delayed neutron precursors so that we know that actually they didn't decay here because before decaying, they were dragged with the flow. So they decayed somewhere else. And that we do by uh, coupling the velocity field from uh, thermal hydraulic software with the DMP position file that we get from uh, Serpent. Important thing is that uh, here is that Serpent is actually very good to do this job because it's tracking the delayed neutron precursors point wise which means it's not mesh dependent. We can deal with coarse mesh. And that actually helps us a lot because if we would have had to use a very fine mesh for our Natronics model, the simulation would have taken forever because Monte Carlo simulations are already computationally heavy. 
So actually here you can see what impact does the fuel flow have on the delayed neutron precursor field. The solid line shows the case where we have a stationary fuel, so it's normal reactor, solid fuel. Then uh, the dashed line uh, is circulating fuel with infinite reactor period. And then the third line, third uh, dashed line, is uh, circulating fuel with reactor period of 10 seconds. And the points, uh, so uh, these uh, lines uh, is actual, um, uh, is an um, analytical calculation, and the dots uh, are the simulation data. And we can see that uh, this method, this coupling method that I presented on the previous slide is being able to capture this phenomena of uh, delayed neutron field being dragged. And this has, in fact, very important uh, meaning. That means that when we are talking about liquid fuel, we have much less delayed neutrons than we have with solid fuel. And that's very important to know, again, as I said, for uh, safety reasons and for uh, predicting the reactor operation and control. Some results from our computational model. This is the velocity and the temperature flow, uh, field distribution within the single channel model that I showed before. And we also do comparison here between the cylindrical channel uh, uh, and between the realistic channel shape. Here we also show how these simulation results compare to the model calculations from Oak Ridge National Lab, and we can see that overall the agreement is uh, quite good. What you can also uh, notice is that the graphite average temperature uh, during steady state operation in a molten salt reactor is always higher than uh, the temperature of fuel in the adjacent channel. And that's because uh, the fuel is acting as a primary coolant as well, um, and also because there is some heat production within the graphite itself from uh, gamma radiation. Well, this is about steady state, which is interesting, but not as interesting and important as transient operation. And here we tried also to capture what happens during uh, transient reactivity insertion analysis. This is for a uh, reactor uh, at 8 megawatt nominal power level. We have comparison between simulation, which is the red dots, uh, ORNL model calculations, and ORNL experimental data. What we see actually is that after the reactivity insertion, we have this initial bump in the power. But then because we have a strong negative temperature feedback coefficient, the power goes down. And the uh, oscillation is due to the fact uh, that every now and then the hot fuel is still re-entering the channel from the bottom. So that makes these small bumps up and down until it normalizes, um, stabilizes. We do have some uh, peaks that are not visible in experimental data, but for the first hand, uh, first try simulation, uh, the results are uh, quite satisfactory. I would say. We do realize that it's very important and necessary to develop these um, coupling tools for modeling correctly the liquid fuel reactors. And there is a lot of work nowadays going on uh, in many labs in Europe, also in US. And we hope that we will be able to have a regulatory compliance software that we will, will uh, pave our path to licensing these reactors and building them. Thank you. Great. Will you take a few questions? Yeah, sure. Sure, hold, hold on to that. Do you have any interest in doing a, a, a full resolution model based on the actual P&ID drawings and all? Like we spoke a little bit about the true pipe diameters and elevations and radiators and, and all that. And uh, yeah. try and, I know that'd be a massive, you know, I, I told you we did a very big one recently, a, a billion and a half, you know, nodes. So it's like, do you, would you need to raise money for your, the supercomputing time, things like that, or would your university support you? A full model, with, because for thermal hydraulics part, we will need quite fine mesh if we want to get any reasonable results, I would say. That's going to be really heavy computationally. And we do have a cluster at the university, but I don't think it will be able to accommodate our needs. So we will have to think about that. Um, 
I think for the whole system, that's my that's my guess or my my opinion. I think for the for the entire system, maybe the lumped parameter simulation would make more sense than actually going into the details and doing a three D model. Are you are you done? Is this is this final for your PhD now, or are you uh, still got more to do? No, I still got one year. <laughs> okay. Ash. Since there are more and more girls into the molten salt reactors, but you are among the first, let us know where do you want to go next? Which labs? Which startup? It's the moment. Speak. <laughs> I started with reactor physics since my bachelor, but I was doing conventional reactors up to the point of my PhD. So molten salt reactors are also new for me. I started uh, to get interested in molten salt reactors two years ago. And um, well, I'm not quite sure yet where I would like to end up. Uh, I keep my options open. For sure, I want to continue in, in this field because not only because I like nuclear, but I see the need for it. And I really hope that the research that uh, me and all the other guys are doing out there, it's not just a waste of time and we will actually get things done. Thank you. Thank you, Ash. Thank you.